past four weeks, we have been focusing our attention on the five solas of the Reformation. In light of the anniversary of the Reformation uh, on October 31st, that day when Martin Luther uh, nailed those 95 theses to the church door. And this morning, we come to the fifth and to the final sola. Soli Deo Gloria. To God alone be the glory. I think it's fitting that after covering all of these solas, sola scriptura, solus Christus, sola gratia, sola fide, that we now come to soli Deo Gloria. To God alone be the glory. And the reason for that is because this last sola, though it's last, seems to really summarize, bring to a culmination, even a climax, all the other solas that we have focused on so far. In fact, it seems to summarize all of them, doesn't it? If we have been saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, then it follows that all glory belongs to God alone. We cannot, even in the slightest bit, we cannot boast in ourselves, can we? As if we have done anything. No, all glory belongs to God. For He is the one who has redeemed us. So this morning, I want you to see just how central God's glory is in everything He does. And then I want you to see how this should then impact the way that you and I live and the way we as a church function in the way we think of ourselves. On your outline, I give you a number of points that are, that are going to guide us through this morning's message as we focus on God's glory. Number one, God's glory comes to us through a cross. God's glory comes to us through a cross. Now, perhaps you're a little taken back by the fact that one of the five solas is about glory. After all, didn't we say not that long ago when we looked at the doctrine of Christ alone, didn't we say there that we were against a theology of glory? Indeed, we did. So how is it that we can now come to this last sola and talk about the glory of God? Well, if you remember back to that sermon where we focused on the doctrine of Christ alone, we compared a theology of glory with a theology of the cross. A theology of glory with a theology of the cross. Remember, some in Martin Luther's day in the 16th century, they affirmed and believed in the theology of glory. In other words, they believed that they could know God by means of their own reason and their own speculations. Though this was the case, Luther rejected this. He rejected this idea that through their own good works and religious duties, they could somehow climb up to God, climb up to heaven and see God's glory for themselves even see his majesty. But Luther wouldn't take this. God would not reveal himself to those who tried and, and sought him by means of their own works or their own intellect. For them, God remains hidden. Hidden. On top of this, Luther said, we are sinners. We're sinners. And we're guilty before 
a holy God. We cannot know God, let alone stand in His presence. We're sinners. We cannot see His glory. Notice the irony here. Don't miss this. In seeking to, to go to God on our own terms and in our own way, in our own strength, in seeking to do this, in fact, we don't end up seeing God's glory, but in fact, we see only our own glory. For that is what we are really concerned about. Luther, on the other hand, taught that things actually must be the other way around. This is quite backwards. We must have a theology of the cross, he said. We, we don't climb up to God. No, God comes down to us. He must be the one to stoop down to us, much like a, a parent might stoop down to a child. He must be the one to make himself known. Otherwise, we cannot know him, and we will not know him. We do not want to know him. In his grace and in his mercy, he has done just that. And he's done it in the most amazing way of all, by giving us the scriptures, his revelation of himself to us. And so it's to the scriptures that we turn. It's to the scriptures that we depend upon entirely to know God. And what do the scriptures do when we open them? What, what do we find when we begin reading through God's word? We find that the scriptures point us to Christ. God's word ultimately points us to the one who is the word. They point us to Jesus incarnate. What is truly remarkable about God's glory is that it comes through a cross. Does that amaze you? Does that shock you? Glory and a cross? These two things, how can they go together? Our king doesn't come with the pomp of Caesar, but as a baby in a manger. He was despised and rejected by men, beaten, and then crucified. Our king, our king, he hung on a cross, and then he died. Scripture teaches us that if we are going to even begin to have just a glimpse of who God is, of his glory, we must go to Christ and him crucified. There's mystery in this. There's mystery in this, what, what seems to be an apparent paradox. It's in a, a bloody crucifix. A bloody crucifix that we find the glory of God. <laughs> Divine glory comes down to us, but it comes down to us through the suffering servant, as the prophet Isaiah said. This is how God has made himself known to us. Through this condemnation comes our justification. And one day, our glorification as well. It's only when we fall at, down on our knees at the cross, it's only then that we begin to see God's glory in any way. So where the world would least expect to see God's glory, we see God's glory exactly where he intended for it to be manifested. 
And as a result, our own glory, it fades away. It dissipates. This brings us to the radiance of God's glory in Christ. If God's glory doesn't come by us climbing up to God, but God revealing himself to us in his own son, it's in his own son, Jesus Christ, that we see the radiance of the glory of God. And we see this throughout the New Testament, don't we? The author of Hebrews says Christ is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Hebrews 1.3. John says the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full, full of grace and truth. John 1.14. Paul, what does he say to the Corinthians? The light of the gospel displays the glory of Christ. Who is the image of God. 2 Corinthians 4 4. In fact, Paul can say in 1 Corinthians 2 9 that the rulers of this age, notice the contrast here, the rulers of this age. It's hard to think of anyone more glorious in a position of authority. The rulers of this age crucified the Lord of glory. Furthermore, it's the death of the Lord of glory that brings glory to the Father. I mean, think about what Jesus says as he's preparing to go to the cross. He prays in John 12. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Jesus says something similar, doesn't he? In John 17, this great high priestly prayer that he offers up to the Father. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. By enduring the cross and its shame, Jesus would later rise from the grave. And as he told the two disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, Moses and the prophets all pointed forward to the Messiah who would suffer and then enter into his glory. Jesus' death, it wasn't the last word. It wasn't the last word, but it resulted in the glorification of Christ at the right hand of the Father. Now, isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting that the apostles, after Christ has risen from the grave and then ascended to glory, to the right hand of the Father, isn't it interesting that the apostles in the book of Acts, they include this in their message to those who are lost, to those who have not heard about Christ, or maybe they've heard about him, but they've rejected him. Acts chapter 3, Peter says, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And so Peter can say in 1 Peter 1, a passage we've looked at before, that our redemption came by the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. And God has not only raised him from the dead, but glorified him. 
and certainly the author of Hebrews, is right on target when he says that though Christ was made lower than the angels for a little while, now he is crowned with glory and honor. There's no doubt that Stephen, on that day, when he bore witness to Christ and paid the ultimate price, his own blood, as they put him to death, he bore witness to this in Acts chapter 7 when he looked up to heaven. And what did he see? What was it that he saw right before he died? He looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus <clears throat> standing at the right hand of God. All of this is a reminder to us. It's a reminder to us that the glory of God comes through a Savior who dies on a cross and is then glorified in his resurrection and ascension to the right hand of God. The world doesn't understand this, does it? The world looks at the cross and what does it see? Foolishness, embarrassment, humiliation, shame, defeat, What does God tell us in his word? The cross, it's the power of God. The gospel is the power of God. What seems like foolishness to a world is the very power and glory of God. Why? Because it's at the cross that we are reconciled to a holy God. And one day, we will be glorified. Number two, God is glorified in the Spirit's work of salvation. Not only does God receive glory in sending His own Son, and not only does His glory, as mysterious as it is, come through a bloody cross, but God also receives glory, as we have seen week after week, in the Spirit's work upon God's elect. Christ has bought a bride. He has purchased a bride. And then the Spirit is, is then sent by the Father and the Son to apply all the benefits Christ has purchased and won for His bride. Now, how does the Spirit do this? Well, we've seen already in these solas of the Reformation. How does he do this? Well, first of all, he irresistibly calls God's elect to Jesus, then causing them to be born again to new, new spiritual life. He then grants them by God's grace faith and repentance so that upon faith, God justifies the sinner, not on the basis of works, but purely on the basis of what his son has done for them. But that's not all. Not only are we born again and then justified, but we're sanctified as well. The spirit who granted us faith and repentance working these things within us, is now transforming us more and more into the image of Christ. Until one day, we will be glorified. And oh, how we long for that day. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, We all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory. Do you contemplate the Lord's glory? Contemplate the Lord's glory 
are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And to top it all off, one day, one day, as those who are in Christ, we will be glorified. We will be glorified. Receiving a resurrected body, one that will never perish, one that will never sin. For believers, if you are a believer here this morning, this is a day that we long for, we hope for, and we have a guarantee of this day because Christ has risen. Notice that from the very beginning to the very end of our salvation, from beginning to end, God receives all the glory. God is not only glorified in the historic work of Jesus Christ, He's also glorified in the Spirit drawing us to Christ and from that point forward bringing us all the way home. So often, we tend to think, even as, as believers, we tend to think that salvation is all about us. Now, don't, understand, don't misunderstand me here. We are the recipients of salvation. So it does have to do with us, absolutely. And think of John 3.16. God loved the world. And so he sent his son. But let me be very clear about this. Salvation is ultimately not about us. It's not ultimately about us. It's not about me. It's about God. He saves us to bring glory to his name. To bring honor and praise to who he is, not to us. Consider, for example, the doctrine of predestination, which we looked at when we focused on sola gratia, grace alone. What a, a great place to see this truth, because in this doctrine, we're taken all the way back before the creation of the world to the very purpose of God, to his very deliberation. As we saw before, God chooses some to say anything in us. Now here's the big question. What is the purpose of his election? What's the purpose of this? Paul says this, in Romans chapter 9, verse 21. He says that the potter, that's God, has every right over the clay, that's mankind, to make one vessel for honorable use and another vessel for dishonorable use. And Paul demonstrated this in verse 17, where he showed how God raised up Pharaoh for the sole purpose of destruction. But, but the question is why? Why, what, what purpose could be behind this? Well, Paul tells us that I, God, that I might show my power in you, Pharaoh, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. You see it? God's name would be proclaimed to all nations when they saw what God had done to Pharaoh and how he had delivered his people from Pharaoh's slavery. But then in Romans 9, notice what Paul does next. He doesn't end there. 
Paul is going to say something very similar about election. In verse 22, he says, What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And listen to this. In order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. You see it? You see God's glory wrapped up in all of this? This is, this is before the foundation of the world. God's glory is front and center. The main aim of salvation is to bring glory to God. I hope you have seen this in one way or another each week in each and every one of these solas. It's a reminder that if we are going to boast, if we're going to boast, it's not in anything we have done. No, we boast, but we boast in what God has done for us and in us. That's where our boasting is. And so we can raise up our arms at the end of this, and we can say with much joy and gladness, soli deo gloria, to God alone be the glory. So, with all of that in mind, how then, how then shall we live for God's glory? What does it mean for you as a believer in Jesus Christ, in light of the glory of God and everything He has done in salvation, to then live for His glory? What does that look like? So far we have seen that God's glory comes in the most unexpected way through a cross of suffering, death. We've also seen that God's glory is foremost in our salvation. It's the very purpose of our salvation to bring glory to Him. And we've also seen that God is not only glorified in His own Son, but in the completion of of our salvation and one day our future glorification as well. How then do we live in light of this as believers? Let me put it this way. What, is it, what does it mean to live for God's glory as a church, as individual Christians? I want to give you just two points. Number one, our chief aim, and that word chief is key. Our chief aim in life and in death is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Our chief aim in life is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Unfortunately, so many, so many people today do not live for God's glory, but for their own glory. We live in a very narcissistic age, don't we? And Christians, sadly, are no exception to this. And if you think that I am not talking about you and me, think again. We are very self-centered people. We are very selfish people. As Luther said, we are turned in on ourselves, curved in on ourselves, thinking that all of life is all about me. It's all about what I want, what I get. We're selfish to the core. This is no small sin. Do not think for a moment that this is slight in God's sight. In 
fact, it's the main problem. Think back to Romans chapter 1. What does Paul say about mankind, about us, prior to Christ? He says, the wrath of God is revealed because what can be known about God is plain and evident, but man suppresses the truth. He says in verse 21, for although they knew God, they did not honor him. Notice the words here that Paul is using. Honor. They did not honor God. They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. And then he says in verse 22, it gets worse. Claiming to be wise, claiming to be wise, they became fools. Why? What is it? What is it that makes us foolish? Paul says it's because we exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling moral man. What is, what is so terribly offensive, and I would say blasphemous, what is so terribly offensive to God is that the very reason he created us was for his glory. I mean, think, of, think back to Genesis. God creates Adam and Eve. How? In his own image. In his image. Why? To bring him glory. To reflect him. And instead, we have become fools, exchanging God's glory for something we have made in our own image. And don't think for a second that just because you don't bow down to some wooden statue made out of wood or gold or precious silver, that this doesn't apply to you. As Calvin said, we are idle factories. In our own hearts, we create gods. Gods that resemble us. Gods we bow down to. But the beauty, the glory of redemption is that when we were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, God, he turns our eyes outward instead of inward so that rather than worshiping ourselves our eyes are turned up and we worship God Amen. we're consumed with worshiping him this is why a self-centered Christian is an oxymoron. It's a contradiction in the most obvious sense. It doesn't make sense. It's irrational. A self-centered Christian. Our very purpose in life is to exalt God, not us. The psalmist in Psalm 115 got it exactly right. Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. If only we would wake up every morning and say that psalm. This is why we exist. This is why we're here. The Puritans in the 17th century who 
were very much heirs of the 16th century Ref Reformation and the reformers who came before them. They made this, this same point over again in many of their confessions, their sermons, even their catechisms, many of which they wrote for little children as well as adults. I want you to just listen to the very first question. This is in what is called the Westminster Larger Catechism. Question number one. What is the chief and highest end of man? Answer, man's chief and highest end is to glorify God and fully to enjoy him forever. There it is. That is the Christian life. We bring glory to God. Listen to this. This is so important. Because if, if you don't understand this, you are going to misunderstand what the Christian life is all about. We bring glory to God when we find Him to be our greatest pleasure in life. Pleasure. Notice our joy in glorifying God. These are not contradictory things. These concepts don't contradict one another, despite what you see out there in some Christians and churches. Oh, that Christians would get this. So many, so many of us live as if happiness and joy and pleasure and satisfaction in life is by definition opposed to God and His glory. As if it's opposed to a life devoted to glorifying Him. Not true! Not true! The greatest, the greatest joy and the greatest happiness and pleasure and satisfaction that you will ever find in life is in glorifying God. Why? Why is that? It's because He is the most glorifying being that exists. Everything else will let you down. It pales in comparison to His glory. I can't, I can't begin to tell you it, that, that if you understand this truth, it will transform the way you live the Christian life. It's not just duty, but there is, tr there is pleasure here that cannot even be described or offered by anything in this world. Nothing. And I want you to, to know that, to experience it by knowing God Himself. Psalm 1611. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So listen to me. Listen, listen to me. Our chief aim in life is to glorify God, but our, glorifi our glorification of God is not in spite of our happiness. Instead, it's the very means to our happiness. 
It's the very means. The reformers got this. God has intentionally, he has intentionally made his glory and our happiness inseparable from one another. John Piper, a pastor, I love how he tweaks what the Westminster Catechism says. He says, our chief aim in life is to glorify God by enjoying Him forever. Number two, worship. Worship is to be at the center of who we are and what we do. It's to be at the very center. It's to be the consuming passion. Now the question is how? How is it that God, we, we've seen so far, okay, God's glory is our chief aim. And we've seen that, that we glorify God by enjoying Him. And that in turn brings joy to us. So the question is, how is this glory of God our consuming passion? And the answer is actually quite simple. It's worship. Worship. When we look at Scripture, what we see is that God is glorified when He is worshipped, praised, magnified, lifted up high. So, worship is the means through which we glorify His name. Now, we glorify God's name in a variety of different ways. We worship Him when we go to Him in prayer on a regular basis, which I, I hope that is true of you. If not, that joy that I'm talking about, you are not getting it in full. What could be more, what, what could be a greater means to receiving this joy than communion with God Himself? So prayer on a regular basis is a means to that. But it's not just, and we all struggle with this, right? It's not just, hear God, here are my requests. Here are my burdens. Though we are to bring those before Him. It's not just that. But rather, is to prayer is to express our delight and who He is. Prayer is the means by which we express and exalt Him and how much His glory is glorious. And not just who He is, but what He has done through His own Son. Do you do this? Do you go before the God, before the God of the universe, not just to bring your request before Him, as important as that is, but to just come to Him and to say, like the psalmists do, I praise You for who You are and what You have done. We also worship God in our families, don't we? We worship and praise Him when we as families and as parents and fathers and mothers lead our children and our spouses in reading His Word and then in singing maybe songs or hymns as a family to praise Him. You glorify God when you go about your earthly responsibilities on a day-to-day -day basis in a way that honors Him. This brings us to what's called the Reformer's Doctrine of Vocation or Calling. Whether God has called you to be 
an electrician, an insurance agent, maybe a nurse, a secretary, maybe a a stay-at-home mom, or even a CEO of a company, whatever it is. You bring glory to God by faithfully, day in, day out, fulfilling those responsibilities that God has given to you. I've said this before, and I think it's important to say it again. We often, we, we often think that we have to do something spectacular to glorify God. You want to do something spectacular for God? Be faithful in the ordinary, mundane, everyday responsibilities that God has given to you. That, over an entire lifetime, will bring much glory to God. Much glory to God. And last, though there are probably many other ways we could think of, we worship and we glorify God when we gather together like this as a church and we collectively preached and proclaimed only then to respond in songs of praise, songs of adulation. In all that we do, all that we do, We are to be those who glorify, magnify, lift up, and worship God. Glorifying God through worship is the center of who we are and what we do as individual Christians and most importantly, as a body of those who are in Christ Jesus. I want to conclude with just one word, since we have spent so much time on these five solas of the Reformation. Why is all of this so important? Why remember the Reformation and these solas? Maybe for some of you, you've never heard of these solas before. Maybe you've never heard of the Reformation before. And so I hope that these these five doctrines and these five sermons on these doctrines have really served to maybe open your eyes for the first time or maybe once again to the glory and to the power of God in salvation. In the 21st century, Christians and churches are characterized by all kinds of things. All kinds of things. My prayer is that the church and this church would be characterized by its love for these five truths. May these doctrines be on our minds and on our lips. And when others come into this building, May they see our commitment to these doctrines and say, Soli Deo Gloria. Let's pray.